perhaps we can get started. Um, we are very pleased to have Rahul Jain to present the uh, UTML seminar today. Uh, Rahul uh, is uh, the Casey Dahlberg uh, Early Career Chair and he's an Associate Professor at USC, before which he got his PhD from Berkeley. Uh, between Berkeley and USC, he was at IBM for a few years. He's won several awards uh, for his research, including the Career Award, the Engen Investigator Award, IBM Faculty Award, and so on. Um, I'm not going to go through the entire list. His interests are in reinforcement learning, stochastic control, statistical learning, and today he's going to be talking about uh, RL using generative models. So we look forward to his talk. Thank you, Rahul. Uh, thank you, Sanjay, for the nice introduction, and thank you for, uh, to, for the, the invitation uh, to speak here. I, uh, uh, it's actually been a long time since I've been to UT, and it couldn't be possible this time, but I hope to, to visit in person next time. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, reinforcement learning uh, using uh, generative models. Uh, the particular focus is on systems which uh, have continuous state and continuous action spaces. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is sort of close to offline reinforcement learning. Uh, there's a lot of interest in those kind of problems uh, nowadays. Um, it's not there's a slight difference between what you know the setting we are considering and offline reinforcement learning, but like I said, they're pretty close. And maybe I should start by so this work actually you know uh, so I should start by acknowledging that this work uh, is uh, 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 you know done with a number of uh, brilliant uh, former students and postdocs and my dear uh, collaborators. Uh, so first and foremost, I guess uh, Galip, who is also he's in your neighborhood, and actually he's he's also present today. Uh, and Hiteshi <coughs> Sharma, who recently graduated uh, and is now at Microsoft. Then uh, a couple of uh, former postdocs, Abhishek Gupta and Will Haskell. And of course, uh, my dear collaborators, Vivek Borker and Peter Klein. So, uh, so what I'm gonna talk about, this is something that we have been doing for a number of years. Uh, started as uh, sort of more like a curiosity project to see what happens. But uh, you know, I, I think we've kind of almost reached uh, what uh, sort of the goal we had set for ourselves. So let me start by just uh, talking, you know, uh, about uh, the buzz around uh, the success of deep reinforcement learning. I think all of us have heard uh, various things uh, in the last few years. Uh, uh, the various successes of, uh, you know, deep reinforcement learning, some of these coming from uh, DeepMind, the, the success uh, starting from the success on Atari games and then recently <clears throat> on the game of Go and, uh, uh, and other games like StarCraft, et cetera. So these are very, very impressive achievements. And I think, uh, you, know, uh, 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 you know, a few years ago, we could not have imagined that <clears throat> we, we would be able to see uh, such performance uh, by machines. Uh, but at the same time, if uh, you know, sort of one looks at uh, you know, on what kind of problems these successes have been achieved, one can note that uh, most of these problems are uh, deterministic move games. Uh, they do have uh, large uh, but discrete state, state spaces, actually very large uh, state spaces. Uh, they have, typically they have uh, discrete action spaces also. And that is the question whether some of this can translate to having some impact on other real world problems that we care about. This is not, I'm que not questioning, but uh, just uh, I think, uh, you know, impressive as uh, these achievements have been, I think still that is something that, you know, we are, uh, we would like to see happen. And the question is whether this can en enable that. So one sort of uh, you know, typical example of uh, such a real world problem is uh, this very simple quadrupedal robot. <clears throat> uh, so uh, uh, typically such a robot, um, the state space is continuous and of, it has of the order of 30 dimensions and the action space is also continuous and uh, that has, uh, the dimension has uh, something of the order of 10. And uh, so, the way people have been trying to solve these problems is, you know, all the models, the parameters, everything is known. We have very fine-grained kinematic and dynamic models for, for such systems. 
And yet for a long time, people have been trying to, you know, train these robots or design controllers for these robots where they can, you know, walk and uh, run and do various kinds of maneuvers. So that has proved very difficult using classical techniques. And so lately, uh, people have turned to model free approaches uh, for such problems. And uh, that uh, at first thought uh, might seem foolhardy because you know, model free approach means that the, the algorithm is going to be agnostic to the kinematics and the dynamics. And uh, uh, so it seems like this is, uh, uh, doesn't seem like a worthy enterprise. But surprisingly, a few years ago, people were able to some, use some of the deep reinforcement learning algorithms, uh, in particular, uh, you know, something called uh, deep deterministic policy gradient algorithm to train such a robot to be able to walk. And this is actually very impressive because this was a problem that was, that has been quite challenging for, for roboticists and uh, people were able to, to, to solve that problem, <clears throat> solve this problem using, uh, what is essentially a model-free approach. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, to make such a algorithm work, uh, you, it, you know, even though, you know, what is reported is that, okay, it took, uh, you know, eight hours or 10 hours of training time on such a machine, right? Uh, uh, but typically what happens is that you actually spend months and months, uh, you know, tinkering and tweaking and tuning parameters and whatnot before you can make, uh, make this thing work. And so there's also been in some quarters, people have also expressed uh, some uh, uh, skepticism that the, such algorithms are essentially doing random search. Uh, so I think the jury is still out on that. So I'm not gonna comment anymore on that. Uh, but I think for me, the question is, uh, can one design algorithms uh, for such problems which are much more systematic, do not require so much tinkering and they can kind of work more or less out of the box. So that's sort of the, the goal uh, that we have set for ourselves. So may, let me may start I ask a by... question? Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Um, this is Peter Stone. So there, there have been people uh, who've, who've gotten you know, uh, robots to learn to walk with all the learning on real robots with um, in a policy gradient kind of way for um, you know 15 years ago or so. Um, there was sort of a spate of, of people working on that. Are, are you making any assumptions here about the but that, that's using a, a, a sort of you know defined policy space where you're optimizing the parameters within that policy space. Are you assuming raw states and actions in this case, or, or are you um, what what kind of assumptions are you making about the, these so the inputs? No, and no assumptions at all. So I I will uh, so this is my problem statement st uh, slide. So I will uh, clarify okay. a little bit more. But basically, no assumptions at all, more or less. But I will I will I think hopefully as we go along, it'll become clear. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so um, uh, uh, so the uh, so let me talk about the sort of the the uh, the, uh, the setting of uh, reinforcement learning at a high level. Uh, so uh, we uh, are going to consider a Markov decision process model for our system. Uh, so X is the state here, U is the action, and W is the noise, and the function f uh, then gives us the next state that the system will transition to. And the state is observable by the agent. And there is also a reward signal, uh, which is a function of the current state and the action. And given this uh, reward signal, then the agent can learn from that and then basically decide what action to take next. And this way, the agent interacts with the environment. So this is the typical setting of uh, reinforcement learning. And in such a setting, we, we typically assume that the function f or the transition uh, probability model for the system is not known. And uh, uh, so now there are going to be sort of, you know, two things to note here as far as the setting is concerned. One, our goal is going to be that the state space is continuous. Uh, and of course we need compactness and things like that. Uh, and then the action space also we're gonna cons uh, consider to be continuous because in uh, these robotics problems, uh, that's what uh, people, uh, that's, that's, that's the setting we have. Uh, the, the, the other sort of variation on a standard reinforcement learning setting that we're gonna consider is that uh, even though you know, we don't really need to know the transition model per se, but we are going to assume that we have access to a generative model. 
and uh, meaning that you know we have access to a simulation model. And the justification is that when people want to train these robots to do certain maneuvers, they want to design controllers for these robots. You know, nobody does the learning directly on the robot. This happens in a simulator first, and you know, and you you do the training in the simulator, and once it works on the uh, seems to work in the simulator, then you put it on the real robot. So uh, yeah, so that's sort of going to be the running assumption all the way through that we have we we have access to a black box simulator and we can get samples at will. Later on, I'm going to relax this a little bit more, but uh, yeah, for now, yeah. So for most of the talk, that's going to be the assumption. Uh, I'm going to consider the discounted criteria. Uh, so the reward's going to be discounted uh, and we are interested in maximizing the expectation of the discounted sum of rewards. So that, that's the goal. And uh, the, uh, we know that, uh, so VSTAR, uh, uh, which is the supervisation of the expectation of the discounted sum of rewards over all the policies. So that's the optimal value function. And we know from stochastic uh, control 101 that that solves the dynamic programming equation uh, where uh, you know there is a little bit of a not, uh, notational overload here, but if you ignore the, uh, the, the first equation, then you can think of the second equation uh, here as definition of the operator T, which is the Bellman operator. And the dynamic programming equation simply states that the uh, optimal value function V star is a fixed point of the Bellman operator. And uh, uh, so, so this operator, uh, 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 as uh, probably most people know, uh, is a contraction operator. And uh, so by Banach fixed point theorem, we are guaranteed that a fixed point V star of this operator exists. And furthermore, uh, we know that uh, there's a very simple procedure that can enable us finding the, the fixed points. So you can start with any V naught, then you operate T on V naught, and then you get V1, and then you do the same thing again. You, you iterate uh, the operator T on V1, and you get V2, and so on and so forth. And you're guaranteed that this will converge to uh, V star, which is the fixed point of the Bellman operator, and that's the optimal value function. And the reason we are interested in the optimal value function is uh, that once you find the optimal value function, you can infer the optimal policy from that. Okay. All right. So uh, just want to kind of point out a, a couple of things. Uh, so so in the in this equation here. So I hope you can see my pointer. So uh, the second term in the in the definition of the Bellman operator is really an expectation of the value of the next state y given the current state x and the action u, meaning that, uh, so, you know, if x is the current state, you take action u, the system will transition to the next state y, and of course that's random, so you're taking an expectation with respect to that. So in uh, the, the last bullet here, uh, so, uh, so, you know, this, uh, this is now presented, uh, th this is the uh, value iteration algorithm, and uh, the second equation here is sort of an expansion of the Bellman operator, and the, the, the last term inside here is, is the same as above, and it's just rewritten. So what we've done is, uh, we have, so this uh, term here uh, uh, should be the next state y, but that next state y can be obtained from, uh, from a simulator. So psi is a simulation function for the MDP. So x is the state, u is the action, omega is the noise, and psi of x u omega will give you the next state, a sample of the next state. And uh, now since psi is deterministic and omega is, is, is the only randomness here, so the, this expectation is with respect to omega. So the point is that I haven't actually done anything. I've not done very much. All I've done is just rewritten the, uh, the Bellman operator. And this uh, pretty soon we'll see, uh, you know, has, uh, has a useful implication. Okay, so what I'm gonna do in this talk is I'm just gonna talk about the tabular MDP case or the finite MDP case, uh, uh, finite states and actions. And I'm going to present what might be uh, thought of as uh, a quasi model free uh, algorithm in the sense that we have access to a generative model, but we don't need to know the model. And uh, uh, as, as you'll see that, you know, the, 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 the algorithm is very, very natural. I think this is something probably people ha you know, have been doing for a while. Uh, for a long time, but what we're going to do is then we're going to build on it to extend it to the continuous state space case, and then we're going to build on that to uh, uh, to uh, design an algorithm for the 
setting where both the states and the actions are continuous. And the entire framework uh, is uh, dependent on uh, sort of an ana analysis technique that you know one could say we developed, which we call the probabilistic contraction analysis framework. So uh, I'm not sure how much time I will have to talk about that. Uh, uh, if there is time, I'll briefly mention it, but maybe after the talk, I'm happy to kind of uh, talk about that in detail. Okay, so let's start with the, the first problem. So this is the finite MDP problem. Uh, the same uh, the setting is the same that I described earlier. The only thing is that the, both the state and the action spaces are going to be finite. And uh, the transition model F is unknown. Uh, but we have access to uh, to a gen, you know to to a gen, uh, generative model or simulation model. So uh, yeah, uh, and uh, like I mentioned earlier, so you know this problem can be solved by doing value iteration, and the second term here uh, is really the expectation with respect to the next state y given the current state x and u, and like I mentioned, the a sample of the next state can be obtained. By, by having access to a simulator. Okay, so what one could do is, uh, so if the, uh, the state space is large, for example, then uh, you know, uh, one sort of computational issue is that evaluating this expectation inside the Bellman operator can be expensive, but what one could do is one could plug in an, est an estimate of the expectation. And we all know how to, uh, uh, to get estimates of the expectation. So all we need to do is uh, get a few samples of the next state and uh, just uh, plug in the sample average approximation. So just to go over the notation here, uh, so psi is the simulation function, x is the state, uh, the current, let's say the current state, u is the action, omega is the noise, and then psi of x u omega will give you a sample of the next state. You get n such samples. Uh, you look at the corresponding values uh, 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 at those uh, sampled next states and you just take an average and you just plug that in. So that's all that is happening here. Very, very simple idea. I think anybody anybody can think of this idea. So, uh, and yeah, and, uh, and you, uh, and, uh, you do, the, uh, do the iteration and then you will have VK plus one hat, then you can repeat this, uh, uh, this uh, iteration and so on and so forth. So all we are really doing is we're doing value iteration by simulation. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, if uh, the number of samples is large, one could expect that uh, you know, something, uh, you know, uh, it might work. Um, uh, but then, I mean, we can't be completely confident of that because uh, you know, we kind of iterating. So there is sort of a little noise being added at each instant. And the question is, okay, you know, is it sort of just gonna, because the noise is, accumulating, so is this not going to work at all or is it going to work? So that's sort of one thing we have to worry about. The other thing is that if we look carefully at what we have done is that in the, uh, the exact value iteration, so T is a contractive operator and that is really a key uh, to both the algorithm and the, uh, the, uh, and, the, and, and the fact that we appeal to the Banach fixed point theorem for existence of the optimal value function. So the moment we uh, plug in t hat, uh, uh, so you can view uh, this iteration uh, as uh, as an operator t hat, and and this is this step is is there is some randomness in it, so it's noisy. So um, uh, so this is not the Bellman operator; it is some random version of it, and it is a random operator. And so in each iteration, now we are iterating with a random operator and uh, you know, we don't, no longer have the contractive property and we can't appeal to the Banach fixed point theorem to guarantee that this will converge to the optimal value function. So uh, it's a simple idea, uh, it should work, but you know, mathematically things have become a lot more complicated. And we, uh, that is again, something we would like to be able to understand and say something about. So before we proceed, let, let's just see uh, whether uh, this thing even works. So this is a very simple setting. Uh, so this is a random MDP with 100 states and five actions. Uh, the y-axis is shows relative error. So for example, 0.1 corresponds to 10% error. And the x-axis has number of iterations. The black curve here has exact value iteration. So you see that uh, for exact value iteration, the relative error kind of goes down to quickly, uh, sorry, goes down to zero. 
and it's uh, nearly zero around 60 iterations. The red curve, uh, the, the dashed red curve, uh, corresponds to uh, to uh, empirical variant of the value iteration that I just described, uh, where you are plugging in, you know, taking five samples of the next state and plugging that in, uh, in, in place of the expectation in the Bellman operator. And uh, the sort of surprising thing is that, uh, you know, uh, the relative error sort of seems to decrease at the same rate, but then it kind of settles down. Um, uh, but it still gets to within two percent of the uh, two to three percent of the of the optimal. the The blue curve here corresponds to taking just one sample of the next state, and again the relative error sort of seems to decrease at the same rate, and then it settles down to within five percent of of the optimal. And I think that's uh, you know I don't know to make a big deal out of this, but that's I think uh, somewhat uh, you know it's, I think it's a nice observation. It's and uh, in the sense that, you know, if one can get away with just taking one sample as, an, as a point estimate of the expectation and still get to uh, within 5% of the optimal, then why do anything more? So, so it seems to suggest that there's something here. And the question is, okay, so can we sort of explore this more and try to understand what's going on here? Okay, uh, so, so this, this is uh, the same settings of same uh, MDP, uh, but uh, you know uh, the comparison is uh, with against other algorithms. Uh, uh, again, this is not meant to be exhaustive. This is just illustrative, and um, it's uh, only the classical algorithms have been compared here. So the uh, the the dashed black line here uh, that is uh, exact value iteration, something I just showed you. And then the overlaid red uh, curve is the empirical value learning uh, algorithm uh, uh, with five samples uh, that I also just showed you. Uh, the, this black curve here uh, on the leftmost side, which goes to zero, that's exact policy iteration. And the sort of the overlaid red curve corresponds to an empirical variant of policy iteration. And the blue curve here corresponds to something called optimistic policy iteration that Johnson Sickless introduced. And the green curve here uh, corresponds to Q-learning. So um, Q-learning, of course, does is you know is the slowest of uh, all of these uh, algorithms, and it's not surprising. It's uh, designed to be slow and stable. Uh, uh, but so I guess if there is one takeaway from uh, uh, from this slide, uh, particularly for the students, uh, uh, and and uh, so the takeaway would be that you know you don't just you know, use Q learning for everything. I mean, you know, I think it really depends on the problem. And if, you know, if uh, you have access to a model or access to a simulation model, then probably there are better things you can do. So I think that I would say is the main takeaway from this. So let me uh, uh, sort of present. Uh, so another sort of, uh, uh, so, so here, you know, I presented a number of algorithms and uh, we are looking at them uh, as, uh, as the, uh, the relative error in them with the number of iterations, but they're not doing the same amount of computation. So the question would be, what about runtime? So, so this is showing the runtime and this is actually from, uh, uh, you know, some time ago. So, uh, but again, uh, this is, you know, meant to be illustrative. Uh, so, so the way this was done was that we said, okay, we would like to be within 5%, let's say within 5% of, uh, of, the, of the optimal. And this is for larger MDP, 5,000 states and 10 actions. And you run Q-learning. Uh, so the black curve corresponds to Q-learning and the Q-learning algorithm took about 160 seconds to get to within 5% of the, of, the, uh, of the optimal. And uh, the red curve here, uh, that corresponds to exact value iteration. And that took about 20 seconds uh, to get to within 5% of the optimal. And actually that's, that, that was better than, uh, uh, than Q-learning uh, for this problem. And the blue curve at the bottom is, uh, is the uh, empirical value uh, learning algorithm. And that took something like a couple of seconds to get, uh, let's say within 5% of the optimal. So surprising thing here was that the empirical variant of policy learning was very, very slow. Uh, so that's why that is not shown. And we also tried uh, other algorithms, uh, but they were also very slow. So again, sort of, you know, this is meant to be illustrative. It's sort of, you know, uh, uh, it's the, the point I want to make is that, you know, the, you have to be a little bit careful, you know, so, uh, 
and, you know, what you should do can really depend on the problem and you should not just, uh, you know, just do Q learning all the time. Okay, so now let's look at what exactly, so this may, hopefully this uh, is convincing enough that maybe there is something interesting happening here. And that would raise the question of what exactly is going on? I mean, can we understand, uh, you know, uh, you know what, what is happening here? Can we prove convergence, et cetera? And to understand that, so one way we can look at it is that we, you know, in the empirical variant of value iteration, what's happening is that we start with some V naught and then we apply a random operator, uh, the random Bellman operator T hat on V naught, we get V2, V1 hat. Then we again apply T hat on V1 hat, we'll get V2 hat and so on and so forth, right? And uh, so if you look at the kth iterate, then that will be the, uh, the random operator uh, iterated k times applied to V naught, except the thing to keep in mind is that, you know, each time an independent instance of the random operator is being iterated. It's not the same random operator. So this might uh, even um, uh, remind you of predictive random matrices, but unfortunately these are not linear operators. And the other comment I would like to make here is that uh, actually a problem like this was studied by Diakonis and Friedman in the 90s. Uh, their interest was in understanding, uh, you know, or having a, a developing a framework for uh, stochastic, you know, analysis of stochastic iterative algorithm, which is kind of what we are also doing, except that our interest was specifically on sort of dynamic programming type algorithms. And what they showed was that, uh, you know, that this Markov chain VK hat, this VK hat is a Markov chain and it converges VK. So this is sort of one way to look at what's going on over here. But the other way is we could say, well, you know, T hat, the random operator T hat is related to uh, the Bellman operator T, which is contractive. And maybe we can expect it to be contractive with high probability. And just like in, uh, you know, in dynamic programming theory, we try to look for the fixed point of the Bellman operator. So maybe the, there'll be a probabilistic fixed point of this random operator. So what would that mean? So that would roughly mean that the random operator T hat operated on, on some random vector V hat gives you V hat back in some sense. It's, this is again, not, you know, not meant to be precise, just a very loose statement. Uh, but uh, uh, our analysis actually uh, depends on trying to clarify some of these things. So what does it mean for a uh, random operator to be probabilistically contracting and what does you know, what, what do we mean by a probabilistic fixed point? So how do we define a suitable probabilistic fixed point? So that's sort of uh, where some of the, the analytical effort uh, has been uh, for this work. And uh, so, so, so recently we have been able to kind of, kind of generalize uh, what we started out with uh, when we were initially analyzing just the finite MDP setting. And there is a recent paper pointed to a recent paper uh, at the bottom. So if you're interested, you can take a look. So I'm not going to get into those details at this point. So maybe if at the, at the end of the talk, uh, if I have time, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly uh, talk a little bit more about it. But for now, let me just say that there is such a framework. And what that framework uh, allowed us to do is to give uh, not only a convergence result, but also fi a finite time sample complexity bound. So in the sense that, so given some epsilon delta, uh, if we take enough number of samples in each iteration and do enough number of iterations, then the error in the value function estimate will be small with high probability. So that's that's what we can uh, that's what what we can show. So the thing to note here is that the sort of you know uh, the sample complexity uh, is proportional to uh, one by epsilon square and log of one by delta, which is quite typical. And of course, there's going to be some dependence on, on uh, the state space size and action space size. Uh, so, so this is number of samples per iteration. So if you want total sample complexity, that will be the state space size times log of the state space size. So that's sort of the sample complexity of this, uh, uh, this algorithm. The other thing I would like to point out here is that uh, we do not make any assumptions on the MDP. This is true for any MDP. Uh, yeah, we don't need any, you know, uh, yeah, anything at all. Uh, I mean, the, you know, one has to understand this is a probabilistic result. So, you know, you're not always guaranteed that you'll get to within, you know, epsilon of the, of the optimal value function, but you'll get there with high probability. 
So, uh, so that's sort of the main result, and uh, at least for the finite uh, finite MDP setting. Uh, but one thing to sort of uh, keep in mind here, and uh, keep in mind here is that uh, this is an offline algorithm. So you're doing this for every state, and you know, and then you take a number of samples of the next state for each state, right? And uh, then you do this uh, update, and then you repeat. So, but you can, uh, you know, come up with an online version of this where you are only updating one state at a time, and uh, uh, that is, and you can also uh, argue uh, some sort of convergence uh, in that setting. Uh, but it will require some, you know, some sort of recurrence conditions, which are quite typical. So again, if uh, you know, if you're interested in that, uh, there is some discussion of that in the paper that's mentioned below. Okay. So maybe a brief pause to see if there are any, if there are any questions. Okay, so if not, uh, so let me uh, now talk about uh, continuous uh, state MDPs. So I think that's, like I said, this was sort of a warm up. Even for us, it was sort of a warm up. Uh, but now we are going to sort of settings which are, you know, a lot more challenging and, you know, interesting. So, uh, so the same setting as before, except that the state space is going to be continuous, uh, but we're still going to consider the action space to be finite. And uh, we, uh, again, uh, as before, uh, we're going to assume that we don't necessarily know the transition model, but we have access to samples from, from it. Okay, so our specifically, our goal in this <clears throat> setting is that we like to design an algorithm that is universal in the sense that it should, you know, we should not be placing any uh, assumptions uh, restricting the class of models we can consider, the class of MDPs we can consider. And second goal is that the algorithm should be as computationally simple as possible. Uh, third is that we should be able to guarantee arbitrarily good approximation. You know, you give me an epsilon and I should be able to tell you what to, you can do to get there. And we should be able to get, give you guarantees, uh, uh, not asymptotic guarantees, not just asymptotic, even if they're probabilistic. So that's sort of the goal we set for ourselves. So, <clears throat> so for solving the, uh, solving continuous uh, state space problems. So, you know, the first natural thing to think about is just discretize the state space. Uh, these are called uh, state space aggregation methods, but uh, you know, uh, in our experience, uh, particularly when these methods were combined with the sampling, they didn't work. So the other, uh, then the other possibility is to consider some sort of function approximation. So you start with some uh, basis functions parameterized by the var theta j parameter. And you take a linear combination of those and try to approximate the optimal value function. And of course, whether this works or not is sort of problem dependent. It depends on the choice of the basis functions, how many basis functions you've chosen, what the parameters of those basis functions are, et cetera. And typically when you do this, there's going to be some approximation error because you know, you're not guaranteed that the optimal value function will lie in the span of the basis functions you have picked. And if you try to uh, you know, uh, optimize over the parameters, you can try to optimize over, uh, you can try to do function fitting by optimizing over both the, the, both the weights alpha as well as the parameters theta, then that becomes a non-convex problem. So again, you know, uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's sort of, you know, it, it's difficult to kind of uh, uh, solve the problem that way. And of course, the other problem is just use deep neural nets. Uh, they are neural nets or deep neural nets. Uh, they are universal function approximators uh, and they do work uh, when combined with the, with the you know, various uh, uh, reinforcement learning uh, uh, algorithms. Uh, but, the, but like I said, one of the goals is that we would like to be able to also give some sort of guarantees. And you know, typically you don't get that. That's very difficult to get when you use neural networks for, for a function approximation. Okay, so what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna do approximation in, uh, in, in RKHS because that's a universal function approximation space. Uh, I think the kernel methods were all the rage uh, in the 2000s. Uh, uh, so, uh, so at least for some part of the talk, uh, that's, you know, that's what we're gonna use. And so the reproducible kernel Hilbert space, it's a, uh, it's a Hilbert space of, uh, uh, that is induced by a continuous symmetric positive definite kernel and, that, and it is dense in the space of continuous functions. 
So you're guaranteed that you can arbitrarily closely approximate any continuous function. So what one can do is that if one has estimates of let's say some value function V tilde at some points Xn, then one could do function fitting, uh, let's say L2 function fitting uh, in this space and one could throw in some regularization. So this is all, you know, many of you probably are familiar with this. This is all very classical. And of course, uh, you know, the problem as posed is, is, uh, is, is can be quite challenging. Uh, but uh, fortunately, there is a remarkable result. Uh, we represent a theorem which says that there ex exists a solution of this form where the functions you should do use for approximation in this RKHS are given by the kernel and then alpha n are some weights. So all you need to do is just find these weights alpha n, but turns out that finding those weights alpha n is actually not difficult. I mean, you know, the whole problem just, uh, you know, reduces to solving a linear system of equations. So this seems like a very nice framework in which one can do function approximation. <coughs> uh, uh, yeah. And uh, it's uh, it's easy, to, you know. It's 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 um, and it's more amenable to analysis. So that's sort of the other uh, motivation we have for picking making this choice. So, so what what exactly are we going to do? So what we're going to do is that we're going to uh, uh, get estimates of the value function at some randomly chosen points, and then we're going to uh, you know do regularized L two function fitting in this RKHS. Uh, but the way we are doing this is we are picking the points randomly. So the whole thing actually kind of, you know, can be viewed as doing randomized function approximation in an RKH space. It is very much in the spirit of Rahimi and Recht uh, for those who are familiar. So that's what's, what we're doing here. And we're basically combining that with the empirical, you know, value iteration type idea that uh, I, uh, we, we saw for the finite uh, MVP setting. So here is how the whole thing works. Oops, sorry. So uh, you sample a few uh, points uh, from the state space. Each of those points gives you a basis function uh, induced by the kernel. And then uh, you do a, you know, a value iteration type update or empirical value iteration type update at those same sample points, which is, this is, so this step is exactly what we saw for the finite MDP. And then, so now that you have an estimate of the value function at uh, some points, you basically do randomized function uh, fun function approximation in the RKHS, uh, uh, which is what I was describing the last two slides. And that's it. So you get uh, the next value function uh, and then, you know, you just repeat. You again get, you know, N samples from the state space and you repeat this, uh, this process and you keep on going, right? So very, you know, it seems like a very, you know, uh, hopefully it seems like a simple idea. Uh, so first question would be, okay, does it work? You know, is it going to numerically work? So this is uh, tested on, um, on a problem called optimal replacement problem. So this is a very, very simple sort of a benchmark problem, uh, partly because you, know, you can actually compute the exact value, uh, optimal value function for this problem. And it shows a relative error uh, on the y-axis and number of iterations on the x-axis. And the, the green curve here corresponds to a relative error um, uh, and you know uh, it's getting to around 0 0.1 relative error or so. Uh, that's uh, with approximation in RKHS and some general RKHS. Uh, the red curve is a specific type of RKHS. So we are calling it RPBF, uh, randomized. Uh, uh, I'm blanking on you know what P stands for, but some basis functions, uh, parametric basis functions. So randomized parametric basis function. So this is just a specific type of, uh, we picked a specific kernel. And uh, so that's what the red curve corresponds to. And the black curve here corresponds to uh, doing function approximation with, neural, with the neural network. I mean, you can still do that. And you know, you see here is that, what you see here is that the, the approximation error, relative error uh, for, uh, Approximation with the RP, RPBF is pretty close to what you get with the neural network. Rahul, so I just have a quick see, question here. Yeah. So if you mm -hmm. do something simple like linear function approximation, how much worse is it than any of these uh, much more sophisticated function spaces? That's an excellent question. So the problem with the doing linear function approximation is that you know the quality of your you know approximation is going to depend on what basis function we have picked. So. 
the, you know, typically, so like I was saying earlier, so usually what is going to happen is that if you give me some set of basis functions, the optimal value function is not going to lie in the span of that, right? And so there'll be some inherent approximation error. So this whole thing we're doing is essentially to kind of get around that problem because, you know, the, like I said, our goal is to, to do something that is sort of universally applicable, universally useful. It shouldn't depend on the problem the basis functions you pick. So uh, I hope that, does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Can I interrupt as well? Uh, sorry about that, Rahul. Uh, yes. So if I'm understanding correctly, you're trying to evaluate the, uh, the value function through random uh, samples of your state space. But your state mm -hmm. space is part of your exploration is based on observations. So how do you trigger your observations to be random such that you can then sample your state space to evaluate your value function? Okay, so if I understand the question correctly, so the question is how do you make sure that there is enough exploration of the state space? And randomly, because right. that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to get random samples <laughs> in your state space through your observations and right. update your value function in those random samples, hoping that they will span your value function space in the RKHS space you've chosen, you know, it could be your motion space, right. whatever. Right. So, so everything yeah. comes from your observations, right? And so yes. yeah. I'm a little yeah. confused there. Yeah, so let me clarify that this is completely offline you're not getting samples like, you know, there is not a trajectory or, you know, that you are generating or anything like that. It's completely offline. So you have a, you know, let's say compact state space, you get 10 samples from it. <laughs> let's say you can choose your, uh, so I think the only thing you need to make sure is that the support of the distribution with which you are sampling, that is the entire state space. That's the only thing that matters, mathematically speaking. You know, of course, actual performance would depend on the distribution. You know, so, so suppose that you just uniformly sample points from the. I understand. From the I understand. I, I, what I was referring to was, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. What I, I, just to tie it down, uh, I was thinking of using this in, say, a real life application of reinforcement learning, right? right. In that case, everything is guided by uh, observations. And. Uh, yeah, yeah. So and I'm your going to exploration. Come to that. And your exploitation is all guided by, you know, mapping from your observation space to your state space, evaluating and updating your value function in your, in this state space. So, again, I don't want to, you know, take away too much from your talk. I was just curious. And so maybe you can answer it now or later. Maybe uh, we can have a more detailed discussion later on, but let yeah. me just make two comments at this point. Sure. Number one, this is a fully observed uh, setting. So we are observing the state space directly. Number two, it is offline at this point. So I am going to talk about the online version in like, you know, like two, three slides. So at each point, you know, each, in each, in each uh, iteration of the algorithm, you just get some samples of the states. You do some value function estimation uh, uh, at those points. And uh, then you do function fitting uh, with randomized function approximation, and then you repeat. That's all that is happening. But maybe some of the, you know, we can talk offline after the talk. No, no, that, that's clear now. So if it's a fully observed, you know, uh, state space, you've captured this huge state space in some, some way yeah. or the other. And right. so that assumption, it makes, it makes sense now. You yeah. can always query yeah. that state space for randomly or, you know. Right. Okay, yeah. great. Sorry for the yeah. interruption, but thanks. No, no, no problem. No problem. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, like I was saying, so this is sort of uh, suggesting that there is, you know, uh, there is um, maybe this idea will, will work even for the uh, continuous state space uh, setting. So then the next question is, okay, so um, can we actually prove something here? And it turns out that we can. So uh, one can, one has a result of a similar flavor that I showed earlier for the, uh, the finite MDP setting that if you take enough number of samples from the state and you take enough number of samples of the next states and do enough number of iterations, then your error is going to be small with high probability. But the things to note here are that 
so here uh, this result is uh, shown uh, where when the when we're using supnorm of the error. Uh, in that case, the dependence on epsilon uh, is pretty bad. It's one by epsilon to the power six. Uh, but it turns out that you know if you're if you're okay with the just uh, just uh, considering L1 uh, norm of the error, then the dependence is one by epsilon square, which is quite typical. So so and uh, I have not shown the exact constants, but uh, you know uh, but uh, all the constants are known. And again, there's a reference at the bottom of the slide. So if you're interested, you can take a look at 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 uh, at the paper. So the other comment I want to make here is that, uh, so this is a continuous MDP setting. And, uh, you know, if we don't impose any regularity, uh, as, you know, restrictions, then it's going to be completely arbitrary. And I don't think we can solve the problem. Uh, but the assumptions we make are actually pretty um, uh, natural. And uh, I, I believe they're not that restrictive. So all we need to assume is that there's some sort of absolute continuity of the uh, of the transition kernel with respect to some measure mu and some you know boundedness of some redon equidim derivative that's all you need and the proof is essentially you know it combines uh, you know uh, arguments for error concentration when you're doing randomized function fitting with uh, uh, you know some sort of probabilistic contraction analysis of iterated random operators that we had to do for the finite mdp setting so again if you're interested in the details you know <laughs> there is a pointer at the bottom of the slide Okay, now let me go, go to the next two things I'm gonna talk about. I think to me, they're sort of more interesting, uh, partly because like uh, Chandrajit was saying, you know, how do you use this uh, uh, for some, you know, from real world uh, RL problems. So the, the, so the algorithm I just described, so that's off in, in some sense offline because you're, you're sampling states, right? You're not working with trajectories, you're, you're sampling states. So the question is, what if, you know, in the spirit of reinforcement learning, you know, you you are the 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 algorithm is interacting with the environment, and it gets one sample at a time. How is this going to work in that case? Uh, so uh, so uh, so what one could do is, uh, you know, what uh, one could uh, let's say use the n previous states that uh, have been visited, and uh, you know, do empirical value iteration at each of those states and then do function fitting uh, at those points. Uh, but the problem is that these, the, uh, these, uh, these uh, states are not independent. So in the, in the, 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 the previous setting, we are sam getting independent samples uh, of the state from the state space, and that is really critical. But if we are working with a single trajectory, we no longer have that, even though we can use the previous uh, samples. So it turns out that some, you know something can still be done. In fact, actually, you know, a lot can be done. So uh, what one has to do is that one should use a fully randomized uh, policy to generate the samples. So fully randomized policy means that uh, in any state you take any action with non-zero probability, and that's all th uh, that you need. Uh, that's that's the only requirement you need to impose on the policy that you're using to generate the samples. And we know that such a uh, policy has uh, beta mixing uh, with geometric rate, and that is sort of, we're gonna make use of that. So now the idea is very simple. So all you do is you uh, use the previous n states that you have visited. You, uh, you get corresponding basis functions uh, induced by the kernel. And then you do uh, you know, uh, an empirical value iteration type update at each of these states uh, in the same way as we uh, saw earlier. So you're, you know, so in state Xn, for example, you're getting m samples of the next state, so x prime m, and then you know you do a sort of uh, an approximate uh, value iteration update, and then once you have this at a few at the points uh, Xn, then you do randomized function fitting. Exactly the same thing as what we saw in the continuous uh, MDP setting, except that there we were sampling the states. Here, the, the, the states are coming from a trajectory, and this is truly online. Okay. So there is a little bit of still a little bit of sampling or simulation involved because you still need to be able to get samples of the next state. Uh, yeah, but uh, like I said, you know, all the way through, the assumption is that we have access to a generative model. So hopefully this seems more practical for some of the, 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 the RL problems that one faces in the real world. 
but the question is, okay, does it work? So here is this tested on the cart pull problem. So uh, here one episode is until the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the pole falls down and the reward corresponds to how many time steps the, the controller is able to keep the pole balanced. And uh, this algorithm is, you know, after about uh, 200, 250 episodes, it is able to balance the pole for uh, around 200 steps. And that's, and after that, it, you don't see much improvement. So seems to, look like, okay, now at least this is a toy benchmark problem. So it seems to work on this problem. But now a question might arise, okay, so if one were to use a deep uh, RL type algorithm for this problem, so how, how, how does it compare? And so what we did was we actually compared a number of algorithms, but I'll just talk about DQN. So what this plot shows here is the average reward versus the number of episodes. And the, the blue curve here corresponds to the average reward seen uh, by using DQN. That's a deep Q network algorithm uh, that came out of DeepMind in 2015. And the orange curve here actually corresponds to, um, you know, we call this algorithm online EVL. Uh, and so the orange curve corresponds to, to the, the average reward obtained by our algorithm. And uh, uh, I wouldn't say that online EVL is doing better than DQN. I think uh, there's something else that's uh, much more important that's happening here. So you see a little uh, spread, orange spread around the orange curve. So that's a spread, that's not the variance, but it is indicative of the variance. And then, you know, uh, so that's the spread, the orange part is the spread of our algorithm. And for DQN, actually the spread is the entire background that you see. So, you know, uh, yeah, so it, so it has huge variance. And um, uh, I'm not sure if this is a phenomena that other people have also observed, but at least definitely in our experiments, uh, this is what we observed. So one could say that the performance of our algorithm is sort of comparable to DQN, but uh, as far as the variance is concerned, so it has much lower variance. So um, yeah, so that's uh, hopefully at least that is uh, saying that maybe at least for some problems, you know, using an algorithm like this uh, might might make sense, uh, particularly when you have access to a an, to a generative model or a simulation model. Okay, uh, so uh, now uh, one might ask, okay, so is one, one is, okay, is one able to prove anything here? So again, uh, one is able to get a, you know, result, a theorem of the kind that we obtained earlier, that if you uh, take enough number, if you sample enough number of points and you get enough number of samples of the next state and do enough number of iterations, then the error is going to be small with high probability. And this is uh, uh, the, the, the norm here is with respect to L2, and then the dependence on epsilon uh, that shows up is uh, one by epsilon to the power four, which is not that good. But again, uh, I think if you if you are willing to settle for uh, uh, L1 norm on the error, then you can still get one by epsilon squared. Okay, so now maybe just uh, uh, one comment that I should have emphasized earlier is that so we are now learning from uh, from a trajectory where the where the samples are dependent, uh, obviously. But as far as the algorithm per se is concerned, there is no difference between the algorithm that I just presented and the algorithm for the continuous state space setting. So earlier, the, the, the samples of the states were being sampled uniformly from the state space. Now they're coming from a trajectory. Rahul, I just want I'll, to clarify one more thing, if you don't mind. Yeah. The yeah. trajectory is coming from it. Instead of querying the simulator at one point, you're querying the simulator for a trajectory. That's the only difference, right? Still the whole trajectory online is, or is it, is it some, how does the simulator play with the online? I'm still confused about that. So there are actually two things going on over here. So you have a randomized policy that you're using to generate the trajectory. And you can do this ahead of time. You know, you you use a randomized policy, and you know you you get a trajectory, and then you you know you don't need to generate samples in real time. But then, while the algorithm is running, you do need a sample of the next state. So you need m samples of the next state. That's happening in as the algorithm is running. So there are two two things happening over here. You're okay, muted. Thank you. 
Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think right. I got okay. what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So the first part you can think of just that some data set is given to you. The only thing is the only requirement on that is that that data should be generated using a fully randomized policy. That's all. Um, but uh, the, the you know, but you still need samples of the next state. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. So. Uh, um, uh, like I said, you know, at the beginning, so one of the goals uh, that we've had is to actually making this thing work, uh, you know, for the settings where both the state and the action spaces are continuous. And the question is how we can do that. So again, uh, just a brief problem statement. So the same setting as before, except that the state and the action spaces are going to be continuous. And uh, again, we're going to assume we have access to a simulation model, but we don't need, really need to know the model. Okay, so so here, so this is a further variation of the algorithms have, that I've sort of constructed so, so far. And this is uh, more like an actor critic algorithm. And uh, what we do here is, so it has sort of two parts. So we do empirical policy evaluation and then we do empir empirical policy improvement. And uh, the way the first part is done is that you <clears throat> get some samples of the states and the actions uh, according to, to some distribution mu. You do uh, empirical policy evaluation. The part that is different from what you have done before is that now instead of doing approximation in a kernel space, we're going to do approximation with the neural network. And uh, it's not just, you know, it's not a regular neural network, but we use a random neural network. I mean, it's a regular neural network, but what we're doing is uh, except the, the, the last layer, the weights for all the other, other layers are chosen randomly. And only the, the weights on the last layer are optimized for function fitting. Okay, and this is uh, you know for for you know some of the, you, you from some of you might be able to recognize that once if you do that, then it's very much like a kernel machine that you have, right? So that's sort of the motivation. And partly the reason we are doing this is we also want a theorem. We want it to work, and we want a theorem. So this is so this is one step. And then the other sort of uh, difference from what we have seen before is that. Uh, we uh, we are also uh, approximating the policy. So we do a policy improvement and, you know, and then uh, we, so uh, in this uh, step four, we get uh, the value of the policy at a few points. And then we do function fitting on the policy also using a random neural network. Okay, so again, this is a standard actor critic, uh, you know, architecture. Uh, except there are a few variations it's combined, you know, uh, so there is, we're using random neural networks for approximation of both the Q value function as well as the policy. And of course, there is some sampling going inside these things uh, as, we, as we have seen before. Okay, so this is the algorithm. And first thing maybe I can, I can you know, quite first question you might ask, okay, now we got a neural network and all that, so is there gonna be a theorem? So it turns out that you can still uh, prove a theorem, uh, which very much in the same spirit as before. I mean, obviously there's a lot more things going on, so you see a number of uh, you know uh, parameters here. So and if you take enough samples of various kinds, then you can and you do enough number of iterations that you can argue that the uh, L2 error in the value function is going to be small with high probability. And again, all the constants and everything is known. So if you're interested in the details, uh, there is a pointer at the bottom uh, of the of the slide. Uh, it's on archive, and you know you can you can find find the find the find the details there. So, so, so this is what we call the randomized policy algorithm, and this is the corresponding so guarantee for that. But the important thing is, I mean, is this going to work? I mean, you know, we obviously, you know, we have had small successes along the way, right? So, toy problems here and there, and the so far the the cardboard problem is the most that we've been able to kind of uh, that's the most sophisticated problem we have been able to solve, and that's still a toy benchmark problem. But early on, I had talked about a robot, right? Uh, the uh, quadrupedal robot problem. So finally, we, we, have a, we have an algorithm that can work on continuous state and action space problems. So is this going to work on that? So we did run it on, on uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, on, on the quadrupedal robot problem. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show you that in a minute, but let me just show you the plot first. So as some of you probably know that, uh, you know, the, uh, so the uh, couple of algorithms, which are sort of the regarded as the state of the art uh, uh, deep RL algorithms. So one is a PPO, proximal policy optimization, and the other is GDPG, something I alluded to earlier. 
So what you see here is the reward versus the number of steps for uh, these, those two algorithms and our algorithm. And uh, the red curve is for, for PPO. So PPO, we have worked with PPO and I, I have to say that PPO really works. We have tried that on even, you know, some really complicated settings, it does work. Um, uh, maybe it may not work on everything, but it's, I think of all the algorithms that we have, we have uh, tried so far, we have experimented so far. I mean, that is really, uh, I think that's something that's really, really good. Uh, so, uh, so the red curve corresponds to PPO gets a reward of around, you know, between eight, let's say, and you also see a little spread around it. Uh, the green curve corresponds to DDPG, uh, not doing so well, but still it's doing, doing something. And the, uh, the red curve here corresponds to, uh, uh the algorithm that, that I just presented, the Rand Paul algorithm, and it's sort of getting something comparable to PPO. And here we did not observe the sort of the you know huge variance problem that we saw with DQM on the Cotpole problem. Okay, does it work? That is really you know, if it doesn't work, then I think all those theorems are just you know <laughs> we're just having fun. We're not really solving problems. So does it work? So here is uh, the uh, the Rand Paul algorithm on something called the Minotaur environment in Pavlovit. And um, yeah, it's. Uh, uh, I don't remember exactly, but I think it uh, took uh, something of the order of uh, 10 to 15 hours to train. So, uh, uh, so uh, yeah, so. Uh, uh, yeah, so. Um, uh, uh, this is still happening in a simulator. So I think uh, the true test whether this thing actually works is, or not is you have to put it on an actual robot and see if you know, it's still going to work on that. And that is something that I'm working on with a colleague, uh, but we don't have anything uh, to, to report on that. The other thing is that when you want to do that, you actually want uh, to use uh, sort of other models. You actually want, you know, so this Minotaur is some some vanilla model of a quadrupedal robot that's available in PyBullet, and we just use that, that as is. Um, uh, but, you know, if you're going to put this on a real robot, you need to have, you know, a very precise model of, of that quadrupedal robot, and you should be training on that. So that is something we're currently working on. That's, uh, you know, uh, yeah, so it's, you uh, uh, it's, I don't have anything to show on that yet, but uh, hopefully next time <laughs> yeah, I'll be able to show you video of this thing working on a real robot. Okay, so maybe I'm sort of out of time, I think. Uh, so I'll probably try to wrap up in like maybe just one or two more minutes. So, uh, so for people who are sort of, uh, you know, theory oriented, they might be uh, interested in sort of knowing, you know, what kind of sort of, uh, you know, what is the analysis based on and what is the theoretical innovation here? So uh, so I think I kind of mentioned this a little bit uh, early on. So the, the, the sort of the, you know, the, the key idea behind the analysis is to, to view, so you can each view each of these al algorithms. Uh, it's really a stochastic recursive algorithms and you can view each of these algorithms as iteration of a random operator. And it really comes down to being able to analyze what will happen if you iterate such a random operator, right? In this case, our random operator, at least in the finite MDP setting was, uh, uh, was the empirical Bellman operator, but later on, you know, we are doing function approximation. So there is some sort of a randomized projection operator also uh, comes into picture, et cetera. And really comes down to being able to, to, uh, to, to analyze that. And unfortunately that, rand uh, that operator is not contractive. So we cannot appeal to standard um, uh, uh, fixed point theory. Um, uh, so we have to kind of come up with the sort of, uh, you know, some new ideas. Uh, uh, and uh, one, but one thing we can observe is that the, the, even though the operator is random, it, you know, because it is an, an empirical version or random version of the Bellman operator, we can expect it'll be contractive with high probability. And so the question is, can one define, you know, such a probabilistic contraction property more precisely? And that is sort of one thing we had to do. And then the other is, okay, you know, so this is not gonna, uh, so this class of algorithms, if uh, the number of samples is finite, is not going to converge to the fixed point of the classical Bellman operator. 
But the question is, will it converge to some other kind of fixed point? And so again, we have to introduce this, uh, some notion of a probabilistic, probabilistic fixed point of such an operator. And that's sort of another thing we have to do. And, and, uh, and once you do that, the, the sort of the key, key uh, uh, idea that makes the analysis work is that you, you, know, you, you construct a Markov chain that stochastically dominates some error process that you're interested in studying. And then the problem reduces to just analyzing the Markov chain. So it might seem complicated, but actually when you, if you look at the analysis, I mean, you know, it's actually not that complicated. It's pretty easy to operationalize and it's, you know, it's not that difficult. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, so just a quick comment that, you know, uh, the, the whole, disc this whole in, the, in this uh, entire talk, I was only talking about the discounted case, but we've also done some work on the average uh, setting. So in, for the average setting, you need to have slight variations of the notions, uh, you know, the probabilistic contraction property has to be defined differently, et cetera. Uh, but that can be done. And again, if you're interested, uh, you know, I, I can give you pointers. Uh, and we, recently we have tried to sort of generalize that to, to beyond dynamic programming. So uh, uh, at the bottom of the, the slide, you see, uh, you know, the, the paper. Uh, so, you know, that's sort of uh, our attempt to basically develop this you know, idea into a more general method uh, that can be useful for, you know, whenever you're faced with a problem that can be viewed as iteration of random operators. Okay, I think I'll, with that I'll try to conclude. So I think uh, one message I would like to convey is that, uh, that the, some of these algorithms are really simple, right? This is a simple, very simple natural idea. Uh, you can make them universal. They have pretty good numerical performance. And uh, in settings where uh, you do have access to a simulation model, and which is, I think, 98% of the time, we, you know, that's uh, the kind of setting we're in, right? Where we have a data set or we have access to a generative model. So, you know, this type of uh, algorithms can be useful. Uh, the, the performance guarantees are maybe weaker than what you would get if you were to use stochastic approximation type algorithm, which gives you almost sure convergence guarantees. This one will not give you that. But, it, it does give you a uh, pretty good numerical performance. And, uh, and like I mentioned, we are uh, at the moment trying to, you know, uh, trying to put this on a real robot and hopefully, you know, uh, it'll work and uh, I'll be able to show you that uh, in the future. Okay, with that I'll stop here. And if you want any pointers, then uh, these are some of the papers on which this uh, talk is based on. Thank you.